Welcome to Fellowship of the Rockies. Uh, if you're visiting with us, especially let me tell you welcome. We are so glad you're here. Uh, we, we're already off to a, a great start of, of a weekend. We're going to have a great weekend. Uh, over the course of the next few services, we're going to baptize over 10 people. Uh, so I know you got to see a couple get baptized, but um, these are always fun weekends when we get to see what God has done uh, in the life of our church through, through baptism and people coming to faith in Christ. And so I have, I have a friend with me, uh, Charles Lowry. Uh, so he's going to be preaching today, so you guys get a break from me. So uh, I thought you guys would go, oh, so yeah. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. And so Charles Lowry is a fellow Texan, so I know that you'll, you'll be excited about that. And so wh why don't you guys do this? Why don't you welcome Charles Lowry to Fellowship of the Rockies? Actually, the one reason the pastor wanted me to come is we, we're cowboy fans, and he wanted us to see if I could get some of that Bronco magic and bring it back to Texas because actually... The Cowboys are going to be pallbearers at my funeral so they can let me down one last time. Uh, uh, we have a lot of jokes about the Cowboys where I come from. You know, how to keep Cowboys out of your front yard, put up goalposts. They'll never get in. And so we're uh, actually, we think maybe next year we're going to televise our games on PBS. Uh, they're educational, but we never win. And so. Uh, uh, I congratulate you for having a great team. Uh, I love the Manning family. I actually got to play golf with Archie Manning last year, and uh, uh, a great, great family. And uh, so congratulations, and maybe one year, who knows. We're going to talk today about relationships, but we're going to have fun, all right? Uh, the Bible says this, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm in some churches that the joy of the Lord is their strength. They couldn't whip a sick rabbit. There's not a lot of joy there. I believe joy may be the greatest evangelism tool we have. People want, they're looking for joy in all the wrong places, I promise you. People want some joy. I am a preacher's kid. I grew up in a parsonage. I actually lived at the church. Uh, that's one reason I became a psychologist, uh, because I thought, well, you know, these people need a little help. And so uh, I, I lived at the church in the parsonage, but then we got a, kind of promoted. Uh, the church got another parsonage down the road about a mile away. And so we had to drive to church. Of course, Dad being the preacher, we had to be there on time. And Sunday mornings were not very fun. I mean, everybody was kind of hollering at each other. You got, you got, we're late again. You, got, you can't wear that. It's church. You can better put that on. You got 32 seconds to eat your Fruit Loops. Praise God. We're going to church. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And I'm trying to eat my Fruit Loops. And my brother, we're running all around. And my dad... He's out in the car. I call him the heavenly honker because he just honked the horn. Huh? Hurry, we're late again. Come on, come on. Everybody's running, finally getting the door, you know, slam all the doors. And I'm the baby in the family, okay? So I'm the fourth child. So I'm in the back seat in the middle on the hump. How many remember, how many remember humps? Remember humps in Christ? Okay, I'm in the middle on the hump. Uh, some of you young people, let your dad explain to you what a hump is. Uh, so I'm in the back on the hump, you know, and everybody's late, running late again. Daddy's mumbling under his breath. And then we pass the heathen's house. Every, every community has a heathen family, don't they? I mean, they don't go to church. They're the heathens, you know. And so the heathens are out there in the yard playing softball and everybody's laughing, you know, and dad's kind of in his underwear drinking a Bud Light. And... And then Dad sees the heathens. Look at those heathens out there. They don't know the joy of Jesus. And my brother and I made a commitment in the back seat of the car. We're going to be heathens when we grow up. We, I, think, I think we're going with the heathens. Don't let the heathens have all the fun, all right? What did Jesus do to start his ministry? Think he had an all-night crusade or a prayer meeting? You know what he did? He went to the wedding feast at Cana. He went to a party. He didn't share the four spiritual laws with anybody. He just had a good time. See, the world will respond when you connect with them before you try to convict them, all right? We try to convict before we connect. So we're going to teach you today about relationships because you're going to have the most pain in your life from relationships, but you're going to have the most pleasure in your life from relationships. And I want to see if maybe today we can just change one thing that would make your relationships better. I tell them in the business world, you've got to get specific in order to get terrific. 
You see, most of the time we come to church, hear a general sermon about general things, and in general we generally decide we're generally going to do generally better than what we generally did before we generally went in there. And generally we go out there, and generally we don't do anything any different, do you? So today as we preach, I want you to think of one specific thing you may be able to do to make your relationships the way God intended them to be. So let me give you a visual so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. Let's just say we're uh, having a picnic, maybe grill some steaks, maybe watch a game or something, and everybody's laughing, everybody's in a good mood, everybody's having fun, and the grill's getting good and hot, just about to put the steaks on. A friend of ours comes in. Let's just call him Bill. We wave at Bill. Bill waves at us, and then Bill puts his hand on the grill and burns himself severely. We go, wow, did you see Bill? Why did he do that? You know, they take him to the hospital. They bandage him up, and you call, and He's doing a lot better, but still got the bandages on. A couple of weeks later, he got to take the bandages off. It's about a month later. He's all healed again. And uh, We're going to have another cookout. We're going to grill some steaks, maybe watch a game. Everybody's there. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's in a good mood. Grill's getting good and hot. Just about to put steaks on, and Bill walks in. You kind of feel it tense up because he's by the grill. I mean, what do you do? Say, get away from the grill, Bill. I mean, what do you do in that situation? Well, everybody just kind of looking at each other. Nobody knows what to do and because we're Christians, so we're probably not going to say anything because we'd rather look good than tell the truth, right? And so we just kind of look at him, and, and, and then all of a sudden, Bill puts his hand on the grill again and burns himself severely. You and I just standing around talking, it may go something like this. That Bill, a nice guy, isn't he? I, my kids play with his kids, same soccer team. I see him every Saturday, and he's pretty normal in just about every area of his life. But, you know, when it comes to grills, Bill's just nuts, isn't he? Nuts. Well, let me tell you, you're pretty normal in just about all areas of your life. But I guarantee you, there's one area you're a little nuts in. And it burns you over and over again. I know all the old psychiatrist jokes. Remember the old psychiatrist joke where the guy goes to see the psychiatrist, he's got two burned ears? Remember that one? And the psychiatrist says, Man, what happened? He said, I was ironing, the phone rang, and picked up the iron. He said, I know, but both your ears are burned. He said, They call back. <laughs> well, that's what your habits do. Your habits call back. And see, you say you're not going to say it or eat it or spend it. I don't, I don't have time to do individual therapy. You understand that? You have to fill in the blanks yourself, all right? But, but you say you're not going to do whatever you do over and over again. That keeps you from being what God wants you to be. But then what happens is you do it again. You do it again. Uh, matter of fact, there's a, not a very pretty verse in the Bible. says, like a dog returns to its vomit. I mean, you don't, wanna even, you don't even want to do it. But you end up doing it. It's like a, uh, the, the pastor wanted to kind of make friends with a neighborhood kid. And the neighborhood kid had a used lawnmower. So he bought a used lawnmower from the pastor and paid like 45 bucks for it. But he could not get it to start. I mean, he just couldn't get it to start. So finally, about a week later, he runs into that little boy. So you that, you that kid that sold me that lawnmower, I want to tell you, you sold me a lawnmower that will not start. And the kid got a little grin on his face. He said, well, Pastor, it, it will start. Now, I, it will start. But uh, you're the pastor, and I didn't want to tell you this because you're the pastor. But, but this lawnmower, it'll start. But it's always been weird. It, it doesn't start unless you cuss. I mean, that's just the way it is. It, 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 it's always been that way. I didn't want to tell you because you're the pastor. But that, that's the way it is. He said, well, young man, I am the pastor, and I do not cuss. Matter of fact, it's been so long, I don't even remember how to cuss. He said, pull it about four or five more times, it'll all come back. <laughs> well, see, that's what happens in your life with people. You say you're not going to do it or spend it or eat it or whatever, and then they pull on you. Your mate pulls on you, or your kids pull on you, or they pull on you at work, and it all comes back. So, so we're going to try to help you, Dave. Just one, one thing, help you in your relationships, because... Here's what the Bible says about relationships. For the Lord God said, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. For the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It's not good to be alone. You cannot be what God wants you to be alone. Matter of fact, you read any psychological profile of anybody that does anything strange, weird, perverted, you'll usually see a little phrase, this person was a 
loner. It's not good to be alone. End up being strange, weird, maybe even perverted. It's by, by the way, it's especially not good for men to be alone. Uh, research shows, you can look it up, research shows that single men go in the prison and the state hospital a lot more than married guys. So, I'm going to help you married guys right now. How many married guys in here? Okay, how many married guys in here? Okay, I'm going to help you guys. I don't know how your marriage is going, but let's look at it in a positive way. It's keeping you out of prison. It's keeping you out of the state hospital. Now, that's encouraging, isn't it? Yeah. And the reason it keeps you out of the state hospital because your wife will tell you when you're crazy, right? She'll say, you crazy. Don't do that anymore. They'll put you in a state hospital. Now, think about it. This is before sin came into the world. So Adam had a perfect spiritual relationship with God, but it's God that said, you cannot be all I want you to be by yourself. Even if you can have a perfect spiritual relationship, with God, you, can, you need to other people to complete you. So that's why God created marriage. That's why God created family. That's why God created the church. See, the church is the family of God. It's the safety net. They, they, that, see, God knew that in a fallen world, we're going to have death or divorce or dysfunction of some kind, and we'll have people who choose to remain single, and God knows you can't be what He wants you to be alone. So the church is where we come together to encourage each other, to hold each other accountable, so those people can be the people that God created them to be. Well, how does think about why would it be that way? Well, the Bible says this about God, and we are made in His image. That's encouraging right there, isn't it? You're made in the image of God. That image has not been it's, been, it's been defaced by the fall of man, but it's not been erased. You have some of the characteristics that God has. Well, what's God like? Well, if you read the Bible, the Bible says God has three personalities. If you grew up in church, you probably heard that referred to as the Trinity, okay? Now, the Trinity is one of those heavenly concepts hard to understand down here on earth. People tell you they totally understand the Trinity, they'll probably lie about other stuff too, okay? They probably don't understand the Trinity. Uh, it's a heavenly concept, hard to understand. Although I don't understand it, I can relate to it. When my kids were young, the cousins would come over and visit, and the cousins would call me Uncle Charles. And my girls would look at them and say, he's not your Uncle Charles, he's my daddy. And they'd say, no, he's not, he's Uncle Charles. No, he's not, he's daddy. He's Uncle Charles, he's daddy. They'd get a little tiff over that. Why? In their childish mind, they couldn't understand how it could be two personalities at the same time. How it could be Uncle Charles and Daddy couldn't understand it. I can't understand how God could be three. For some reason, God the Father needed God the Son in order to do the work of salvation. God the Son needed God the Holy Spirit in order to make His love permanent in our lives. And then it says we are made in the image of God. So what does that mean practically? Here's what it means practically. You need to be around other personalities to complete you. Because you can't create your own personality. Now, the moment I say that, I realize I just said that wrong. You actually can create your own personalities. But you don't do it in a divine way. You do it in a dysfunctional way. Matter of fact, we have a diagnosis for you if you do that. We call that multiple personality disorder, and we will put you in a state hospital if you do it that way, okay? Not the way to do it. The way to do it is to be around other people to complete you to be the person that God wants you to be. Well, how does it work? Well, life pretty much works in stages. First stage uh, of life that many go through in relationships is that wonderful stage of life. That's the what I call the hormone heaven stage. That's when one gland's calling out to another gland, let's get together. You know that stage of life. And if you're in that stage of life, that's a great stage of life to be in. But it's a pitiful stage to watch, isn't it? You know, uh, I used to do premarital counseling. I quit doing that because that's an exercise in futility. You know, I, I thought they, they, uh, they, I wanted to say, take your hands off each other and listen to me. You know, uh, I'd say something like, have a job. No. Finish school. No. Got any money? No. How are you going to live? Love. You know, and then they jump on each other again. You know that stage, you know. Uh, I want to say I give you five years for this body chemistry to turn to toxic waste. Uh, uh, but I'm a nice guy, so I say something like, why don't you register paper plates at Toys R Us? Because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, uh, and, 
And by the way, guys lie during this stage. Let me just help the women here. Guys lie during this stage. They just have the urge to merge, and so they lie. I mean, I lied. I'll just be honest with you. Whatever my wife Penny said, I just said yes. You know, she said, you love shopping? I love shopping. You know, you love the mall? Oh, I love the mall. Just to watch you shop at the mall, that'd just be wonderful. God knew I was lying. He said, there's my boy Charles. He's just lying. Just wants to merge. I better teach him a lesson. He'll lie the rest of his life. Birth angel, come here. Send him three daughters. He's going to spend his life in the mall for lying. Uh, so, well, that's how I got three girls. I, uh, but that's, that's how I know so much about women because I've lived in a girl's dorm most of my life. Uh, and let me just tell you, some days were tough. Some, some days I'd actually go out and talk to the mailbox. It was the only male thing in my house. I'd say... I'd say, Mailbox, it's tough in there today, Mailbox. Uh, can you imagine three teenage girls at one time? I mean, we had so much hairspray, things would actually stick in midair. I mean, I, I could take a Diet Coke, stick it in midair, and come back and get it later. So, uh, but that's that wonderful stage. We've all been there, haven't we? That wonderful stage. Well, what happens after wonderful? <laughs> War. <laughs> you see, objects attract from a distance. But opposites attack up close. See, the very thing that attracted you from a distance starts to irritate you up close. See, when I was dating Penny, what attracted me about her was she was really, not only is she beautiful, she's organized. Man. I didn't know how organized until we got married. Well, actually, she wanted to clean up the rice at the wedding before we went on the honeymoon. And I thought, this girl's clean, you know. Closets color coded, shoes face north, you know, that kind of personality. Put my Diet Coke down and turned around, it's already in the dishwasher, and I'm not even through with it yet, you know. Uh, I put the paper down and it's gone, and I haven't finished reading it yet. I asked her one time, What do you think God's trying to teach me? And he said, She said, He's trying to teach you, enjoy things while you have them. You never know when you're going to lose them. And so, uh, one night I got to go to the bathroom, came back, the bed was made, and I thought, this, this is too much. You know, this, is, this is too much. Uh, uh, but we've all, we've all been there, haven't we? I mean, sometimes it happens quickly. One guy got up on his honeymoon, looked at his new bride, and says, where's my hot breakfast? Mother always made me a hot breakfast. She said, you want a hot breakfast? Put those Fruit Loops in the microwave. That'll be hot. <laughs> hey, buddy, set those cornflakes on fire. That'll warm you up. We've all been there, haven't we? Uh, Penny and I made that commitment never go to bed angry we we're up the first three weeks we were married and I thought this is a lot harder than what I thought you know, uh, we go from wonderful to war but then we start to wonder we wonder did we take the wrong job or move the wrong place we even wonder did we marry the wrong person all these guys that come in they'd be all nervous you know seeing a psychologist and they're looking around and I'm looking around, too, because I've seen some strange people. When they look around, I look around. I don't know what they're looking for. Uh, I mean, one guy was so paranoid, he thought the people in front of him were following him. But that's paranoia, you understand. So when they look around, I look around. Finally, he leans forward, and I lean forward. I say, what, what's your problem? He says, Doc, it's terrible. It's terrible. I said, tell me what it is. It's terrible. I said, tell me. He'll say something like this. Doc, I, I think I've married the wrong person. I said, that's your problem? That's it? He said, that's it. I said, I got good news for you. Everybody else did too. What else you want to talk about? He said, what do you mean? Well, in a sense, everybody married the wrong person. You married this fantasy person. They look good. They smell good. They never go to the bathroom. You got a perfect person here. And then what happens? You get married. You got a real person. They don't always look good. don't always smell good. Spend their life in the bathroom. You got a, you got a real person here. But what happens is you start comparing your reality with a fantasy that does not exist. These guys would say, oh, Dr. Lowry, I'm falling in love with my secretary. She dresses better than my wife. She listens better. She's always in a good mood. So I got an answer for that. Pay your wife. Let her off at 4 o'clock. She'll be in a great mood, I promise you. you know, we start comparing things that can't be compared. These ladies, when I was in private practice, they'd say, oh, Dr. Lowry, my husband would just listen the way you'd listen. If he'd be patient the way you're patient. If he'd look into my eyes when I talk the way you look into my eyes. I said, pay him $150 an hour like you're paying me. He'll look in your eyes when you talk. You see, you start comparing things that can't be compared. 
You really only have two choices in life, my friend, only two. You can tear up that fantasy that does not exist, and you can accept the people in your life as a gift of God, your mate, your church, your pastor, your job, your kids, as a gift of God, or else you'll spend the rest of your life tearing up those people, trying to make them look like a fantasy that does not exist, and you'll end up being a very miserable person. The fact of the matter is relationships just take work. They take work. If the grass is green, it's because somebody's watered it, fertilized it, taken care of it. If the grass is green and nobody appears to be taken care of it, there's a septic tank somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Life doesn't work like that. So you have to do the work of relationships. But to do the work of relationships, you have to understand the worship of relationships. Relationships are not secular. They're spiritual. You see, another person, because they got the same problems you have, can never meet your deepest needs. They can never love you unconditionally all the time and give you total forgiveness. See, we all come from Uncle Adam. Remember Uncle Adam? We all come from Adam's family. Now, what do you inherit from Uncle Adam? Sin and death. You're going to die and you're going to sin. You cannot, the more you can redeem your Adam suit, the better off you're going to be down here, all right? But you can't totally redeem it. So you're always going to have problems and difficulties. And so when you're looking for somebody else to meet all of your needs, they got the same problems and difficulties you had. Jesus made it pretty clear on one occasion. A lady came to see him, or they met, and she had been married five times. I mean, she was taking a whack at finding a good man, wasn't she? I mean, five. Now she's living with a guy. And Jesus said to her, and he may be saying to you, when are you going to realize a person cannot meet your deepest needs? And when you're looking for a person to do that, you're going to be dissatisfied and eventually look for another person to do that, and you're going to be dissatisfied again, just like your life has been. And then he said, why don't you let me meet those needs? Let me give you unconditional love and total forgiveness so you will feel loved and treasured and blessed as a person. So then you'll be freed up to love and to treasure and to bless other people. See, I believe the way you treat other people actually is an act of worship. Matter of fact, if you read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, talking to men, and all of chapter 3 uses the word likewise, which means it's really talking about Jesus in chapter 2. It says Jesus didn't do evil against people. He blessed people. And then it says likewise, this is what we're supposed to do. And it says to men, if you don't make your wife a partner and you don't dwell with her in an understanding way, your prayers will be hindered. In other words, you'll get your prayers answered not by your prayer life or how much you give. You'll get your prayers answered by the way you treat people. Now, it goes on to say, not just talking to men in verse 8 and verse 9, especially verse 9, it's talking to all of us. It said this, when people do evil against you, don't do evil back. When they revile, you don't revile back. You bless them. And then, it's, and then it says this. Why do you bless them? Because that's why you were called to bless people. And then when you bless people, you will obtain a blessing from God. Matter of fact, verse 12 says, just the opposite of verse 7, when it says your prayers will be hindered, you know what verse 12 says? God's ears will be open to your prayers. People always talk to me, what's my purpose in life? It's pretty simple. You're to bless people the way God has blessed you. You're to love people the way God has loved you. And God says, when you bless those people, I now will bless you. And here's why that's crucial. It has to be an act of worship. And the reason is this. Because people need love the most when they least deserve it. But I'll tell you about my wife. When my wife's in a good mood and things are going well and there's money in the bank and my schedule's full and the grandkids are doing good and people are buying my books, which I'd appreciate you would, uh, she's in a good mood. She's in a good mood. But she doesn't need my love that much then. You know, when, when she really needs my love, she's in a stinking mood. No money in the bank, schedules empty, nobody's buying any books, the grandkids are messing up. I say something nice to her. She says something ugly back to me. That's when she really needs my love. 
And that's when I really don't want to give it to her. I want to say, stick it in your ear, lady. I deserve better than this. But I can do that then as an act of worship. I can love her when she's a jerkette. Why? Because God loved me when I was a jerk. That's why. You see, she can love me when I'm a jerk. Why? Because God loved her when she's a jerkette. You see, we have a higher commitment to our relationship. See, that, that's why we've been married over 40 years. That's why we've been married the rest of our lives. That's why we grow, break our hips together. Why? Because we see it as an act of worship. You cannot keep up the work, and it's hard work loving people, I promise you. You cannot keep up the work of relationships unless you understand the worship of relationships. Because when you do it out of worship, you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for Him. And God says, when you do it for me, then I'm the one that will bless you. Now, here's what you have to understand. There's where it gets a little bit complicated, and most people miss it right here. And if you miss it right here, you will not have great relationships. Here's the way we think. Naturally, the Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And that's what occurs in your life with your habits and all those kind of difficulties. Uh, and that's what I teach around the world. There are lots of business and people, you do this, this is going to happen. Uh, but we think that applies in the area of relationships. For example, if, if you're a farmer and you plant corn uh, and you, you do what you're supposed to do to corn, you put the seed in, you fertilize it, you keep the weeds out, you do whatever farmers do. I'm not, I'm not a farmer. But you, that, that's, that's your field, and so you plant that corn. And harvest time comes, and you tell your family, I'm going to harvest the corn. And you don't go to that field, you go to another field where you have not planted. You would say, dumb farmer, right? It's, you, you're not going to get corn where you didn't plant it. That's the way the world works in habits, but that's not the way God works. You see, God owns all the fields. And in relationships, here's how it works. You say, okay, God. Matter of fact, you'll probably leave today. Oh, okay, God, heard that sermon. I've been blasting a lot of people, and I need to bless some people. Even they would do evil against me, I'm going to bless them back. And so that's what you start doing. Maybe your mate, maybe your kids, maybe your neighbor. I'm just start blessing them, and I'm just blessing them. And just bless them. Man, I'm doing so good. You know, go back next Sunday, get motivated again, go back and bless them. Bless them. But then they're not blessing back. And you start going, wait a minute. I've been blessing you for three weeks. You're not blessing me back. And then you start getting mumbling, you know, getting mad. Then you start talking to other people, you know, you know, I do this and them. They never do anything back to me. And then you start praying about it, you know, and talking to your friends. About, you better pray for them because they're not blessing me. You know, you're going to have miserable relationships because some people will never be able to bless you back. Let me give you a physical example. You can't see emotions, but you can see physical. Ever had a bad toothache, maybe like an abscess tooth? I mean, you, you just cannot hardly walk. You're in so much pain. When you're in that situation, you do not think about other people. You only think about yourself. And if, can I get through the day? Can I get through the minute? Can I, I, I need medication. I, I, I need something for this pain. That's all you're thinking. Many people are in so much emotional pain. They've had so much family, so much dysfunction. And by the way, by their fruits you shall judge them, but by their roots you shall understand them, you see. Uh, so they've had so much pain in relationships, they're unable to bless you back. You know what God says? Don't worry about it. I'll bless you back. I'll bless you in ways you didn't know. I'll give you an example of that. I was... Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a, a national, a big insurance convention. And uh, uh, I, I like to speak to big business conventions because they pay a lot more than churches. Understand? That's just the bottom line, okay? Uh, uh, and so I need enough of those to kind of keep my ministry going, all right? Uh, so I got this really great situation, big, big paying deal. And so uh, national insurance convention. So the guy that booked me, or the guy that went through the office and set it all up, uh, the, the president of the committee there that was picked the speaker, I, I got a chance to meet with him. And I said, let me just ask you a question. 
why did you choose me as the speaker? Because it was a little higher level than what I usually get. Uh, and because uh, I want to get some more of those, you understand. So how did, how did, you, how did I do this? You know? uh, and he said, oh, I can tell you exactly how. He said about two or three years ago, you came to this little church in North Carolina. And I can remember the church because from my point of view, it was a bad weekend. It was a small church and nobody bought anything. And it's just, you know, just one of them. I'm thinking, God, why am I in this God for a second? You know, you know, you know I'm, 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 I'm as sorry no good as you are, okay? I just got my Bible up here. Uh, so I grumble just like you do. And so I, I can remember the situation thinking that was, that was pitiful, you know. He said, you went to that little church in North Carolina. And my mind said, yeah, I remember that. Uh, and he said, my dad, we'd lost my mom. He was living with me. And he was just depressed, bad attitude, discouraged about everything, didn't want to do anything, never want to go to church. So I told him, you know, we got this guy coming. And that was YouTube had just started. And I said, let me show you him on, on this, you know, deal. And uh, he's kind of fascinated by YouTube. And, then he, and, he, and he watched me. And, and he, he started laughing. He said, I, I'll go. I like that guy. You know? uh, so he went on Sunday morning, and he said, I sat beside him. For the first time, he laughed out loud. I, I never heard him laugh out loud in years. They had a couple's banquet that night, and he said, uh, you think that pastor would let me go to the couple's banquet because I want to hear that funny guy again. You know? And he saw the other pastor. He called the pastor. I said, oh, that would be great. He said, after the banquet, the book table, he bought, I bought it for him, a comic belief book, and you signed it. And he said every night he would sit in his chair and he would read one of those lessons and he would laugh. And I could see his whole demeanor starting to change. By the way, laughter is a good medicine. And he said, when I would hear him laugh, in my mind I thought, if I can ever bless the guy, who wrote that book, I'm going to bless him. And then he looked at me and said, that's why you're here. You see, the reason I was there is because I blessed a little guy in a small church that in my mind was a miserable experience. They didn't bless me back, but God did later. You see, once you start to understand it that way, everything starts to change. And here's how it starts to change. Because once you get in the blessing business, you become a partner with God Himself. You see, now you're in the family business. You see, this church is the family business. This is the franchise of God and Son. We're here to bless people. I'll give you an illustration of that. My wife was here last night. Uh, she's with grandkids today. Uh, She's a cultured lady, okay? She has class. You've heard me speak. You know I, I have a Ph.D., but I have no class. I, I, I have no culture. She spent her entire life trying to give me culture, you know, class me up, take me places. She said, we're going to New York to the Met. I thought we are going to a ball game. I was pretty excited about it. Come to find out, we went to this large museum. She loves museums. Uh, she loves the opera. I, I don't get the opera. My neighborhood, you shot a guy, he died. He didn't bleed and sing for 20 minutes. He just died. I don't get the, I don't get the opera. Uh, she likes the ballet. I, I don't get the ballet. I told her if they got taller men and women, they wouldn't have to stand on their tiptoes. Everybody could relax, have a lot more fun. You know? uh, so... Uh, she likes classical music. I said, if that good, they'd get some words to go with it. So, I mean, it's not, I don't have a lot of culture. But I read something out of the world of ballet. The New York City Ballet was given a gazillion dollars by somebody, and they gave him all this money to get Barishnikov to come and dance at the New York City Ballet. And he agreed. Evidently, if you got a gazillion dollars, you can get the master, Barishnikov, to come and dance at your ballet. But he said, I don't want to dance an individual ballet, I want to pick somebody from the group and, and do a duet. And so he picked this girl. Her name was Gelby Kirkland. And the guy writing the article said, I thought that was the worst choice he could have made. I've been watching this girl for years. If anything, she's below average. She has really not any significant dance moves. She has no personality. She would definitely not have what we call charisma. But he chose her, and it's my job. So two weeks later, I was on the front row. And Gelby Kirkland came out, but 
I looked at her and I thought, that's not her. They, 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 did, they replaced her. Maybe he changed his mind. But then I looked closer and it was her. I looked on the program. It's her. It just didn't look. She looked like a different person. And then they started to dance. He said, I was blown away. I couldn't believe the moves that she had. I couldn't believe the confidence she had, the personality, the charisma of this young lady. And then it hit me. He said, it was the power of the transformation that occurred when her partner was the master. When you get in the blessing business, when you decide not to return evil for evil, but to bless, you will partner with a master and you will not believe the transformation that will occur let's pray father thank you for our time together lord thank you that you're such a good god thank you that you're our god because of jesus christ teach us to bless people the way you have blessed us in jesus name we pray amen Thank you, Charles. Would you bow your heads with me and just close your eyes? L let me just ask you, what is God saying to you as a result of this message? What is he saying to you as a result of this, this word? Maybe more importantly this, this morning, what, what is your next step? Every one of us in this room has a next step. Whether, you, whether we've been a Christian for a short time or a long time, we're all on a Christian journey. We're all on a spiritual walk. So let me ask you, what is God saying to you as a result of this message? And then what is your next step? Do you need to learn to bless those that are around you, bless those relationships around you? Or you just need to come to the place to where you just accept Christ and ask Him to come into your life and just to forgive you of your sins? Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, I just need someone to pray for me that I'm in this season of life, I'm in this time of life, and I would just like to have someone just to pray for me. So if you're here this morning and you're carrying a burden, we want to lift that burden, we want to pray for you. So in just a few minutes after I pray, we're going to stand. And when we stand, if you need prayer in any area of your life, as we stand up, would you step out and begin making your way down to the front? You don't need to be embarrassed that you need prayer. Every one of us needs prayer. I need prayer. Charles needs prayer. The Apostle Paul asked for prayer a lot in the Scriptures. So if you need prayer in any area of your life, we want to pray for you. So after I pray, we stand, you come. Father, we thank you for today. And Father, we thank you just for your love and we thank you for your grace. Father, we thank you that we're in a relationship with you and through that relationship that we have the ability just to bless others and so Father we ask that if there's people here this morning and they're carrying a burden whether it's financial or it's a relationship or it's a situation in their life or it's a circumstance where they want to pray for someone else Father may we be able just to bless them this morning Father would you just give them the courage, would you give them the strength just to respond to you. And Father, we thank you for the number of answered of prayers that we have in the front of this room. So Father, we just look forward to see what you're going to do. For we ask these things in Jesus' name.